Football is a game that divides opinion and also tends to create a lot of hatred at times. It does so because the game's built that way. We simply can't be disloyal to our club or to our country, and we'll always be on the defensive if someone comes up and starts laying into our boys. However, there are moments in the game when all such things are forgotten and differences are cast aside, an event that brings all fans closer together. It was a horrendous sight watching Denmark's Christian Eriksen collapsing on the field during his country's Euro 2020 opener against Finland at Copenhagen's Park End Stadium on Saturday. The Inter Milan playmaker had shown no visible signs of discomfort before he collapsed, and the scenes that followed can never be forgotten. From Simon Kier giving his friend CPR, to paramedics rushing to the pitch, to the Danish players forming a wall around their teammate to make sure that the hawkish eyes of the broadcasters couldn't see what was happening. The human tent that had formed around the 29-year-old's prone body presented as an ominous sight, a shield to prevent the player from prying eyes and perhaps, and thank goodness it wasn't the case, shielding everyone from witnessing the moment the light might have gone out. Eriksson's girlfriend, Sabrina Kvist Jensen, mother of their two children, was beyond consolation, and both Simon Kier and Kasper Schmeichel tried their best to comfort her. Paramedics were on point, doing everything they could to save his life. The supporters, whether they were Finnish or Danish, all wore somber expressions, sad, with tears in their eyes, praying that the player would get up and walk it off. As players from both teams, visibly distraught, waited for some good news, UEFA decided to suspend the game, and who can blame them? How can anyone play for or against a team who just witnessed one of the best players in Europe suffer a cardiac arrest? The entire arena came to life after it was announced that Ericsson had regained consciousness. This was the moment all of us had been waiting, praying, and hoping for. So, what exactly happened? According to the Danish team's doctor, Morten Boersen, Christian Eriksen had a cardiac arrest and was gone before he was swiftly resuscitated on the pitch. The doctor further revealed that he doesn't know how close Eriksen came to losing his life, but admitted that the player responded to the first defibrillation. The manner in which the medical staff reacted was perhaps the reason why things didn't take a turn for the worst. A defeat for Denmark, but a win for life. The game resumed about 90 minutes after the nightmarish scenario, and Finland ended up winning the game. However, no one could have blamed the Danes for not showing any commitment, which they actually did. In fact, you've got to respect the heart of this team that they decided to play on even after seeing their best player lying down on the pitch and in mortal danger. Manager Kasper Hulmand has calmed fears by revealing that the player was more concerned about the rest of the team than his own state. Christian was concerned about us, and he doesn't remember a lot about yesterday, so he asked how the team was doing. Christian is a big person. He felt that he can play because he is at his happiest on the pitch. He said this morning that we maybe had it worse than him because he wants to get out on the training pitch again. We have to see if we can gather ourselves and go out and play for Christian. Did UEFA do Denmark dirty? In the aftermath of the incident, a lot of people jumped at UEFA for limiting the choice to Denmark for restarting the game when the players were visibly distressed. Most of us actually thought that the game would be postponed. However, the game restarted once the Danish squad received a message from Ericsson. After further reflection, Hulman said that it would have been better if UEFA had postponed the game. Indeed, such an incident leaves a lasting impression, and from a psychological point of view, it's difficult for the players to carry on like it was business as usual. Peter Schmeichel was livid at UEFA's decision as well and had this to say, Something terrible happens and UEFA gives the players an option to go out and play the game the last 55 minutes or whatever it was, or come back at 12 o'clock the next day. I mean, what kind of option is that? It was not an option, it was a ridiculous decision by UEFA, and they should have tried to work out a different scenario and show a bit of compassion, and they didn't. I don't know about other solutions, but why 12 o'clock? Why take TV scheduling and all of that into consideration? Why 12 o'clock? How the footballing community reacted Emotions were running high and everyone from Ericsson's current and former teammates to adversaries to former managers were all praying for his well-being. The likes of Marcus Rashford, Jadon Sancho and Harry Kane, who was Ericsson's teammate for a number of years at Tottenham, sent their wishes to the midfielder. Ashraf Hakimi, his teammate at Inter Milan, also dedicated his goal to the Dane, while Romelu Lukaku screamed Chris, I love you at the camera after scoring for Belgium against Russia. 
Now, we don't know what will happen to Ericsson with regards to his career, but we can rejoice in the fact that the player is stable and conscious, and that's what matters the most. Denmark might have suffered a huge setback, but perhaps this incident is going to rally them into doing well for their teammate. What was Southgate thinking? OK, so England managed to win their opener against Croatia. But to be honest here, the victory wasn't all that convincing. Raheem Sterling scored the only goal of the game, but more than the result, the most shocking part of this encounter was the starting 11 laid out by Gareth Southgate. Now, we're not trying to belittle the English manager here, but when you've got a squad that can actually play attacking football, why make calls that would leave 90% of world population gobsmacked? For the left back, England have two solid options in Luke Shaw and Ben Chilwell. Both men didn't play the game, with the latter not even on the bench. In their place, Kieran Trippier, predominantly a right back, started. But that's one selection gamble that we can look beyond. Raheem Sterling's form has been patchy to say the least, but the Man City man was given the nod ahead of Jack Grealish. Of course, Marcus Rashford not starting makes sense, given that the Manchester United man has been struggling for form and fitness in recent months. However, the Aston Villa man has done everything he can to show that he can be the X-factor that the three Lions need to get the job done. At right back, Kyle Walker was given a start, but the veteran fullback delivered a performance that was quite forgettable. Rhys James must have made a case to be in the starting 11 for the next game on account of Walker's mediocre display. However, one gamble that was bold but inspirational was the pairing of Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice. The Leeds United man was a real live wire throughout the encounter and was very solid. While under Bielsa he plays in a more conservative role, Phillips actually shone in a more attacking role ahead of Rice. If there was a time to announce his arrival, then this was the perfect stage. Leeds fans have known all along just how good he is. Phillips might be seen as one of the best holding midfielders in the Premier League, but against Croatia he was more than that. He produced the decisive moments of the game, driving beyond the opposition midfielder before turning away from his marker and setting up Sterling to score. If you look at his heat map, the midfielder was playing in a deeper role, but was also willing to move into a more advanced role whenever needed. Phillips was the fittest player on the pitch, and if he's able to maintain that kind of form, England can back themselves to do well against even better opposition. However, allowing the team more creative freedom will be equally important, since Harry Kane did cut an isolated presence in Croatia's penalty area for most periods. Netherlands and Ukraine play a five-goal thriller. A Denzel Dumfries 85th minute goal helped the Netherlands register a 3-2 win over Ukraine in their Euro 2020 opener. This game was classic entertainment and ended up being an ideal start to the tournament for the Dutch. The first half was goalless but was nonetheless an absorbing affair. But it was the second half that kept all of us glued to our seats. Netherlands made it 2-0 very quickly but then the Ukrainians scored two brilliant goals to make it 2 all. Euro 2020 has only just begun and we've already had the game of the tournament. Here's hoping that we see more of the same in the coming days. Belgium make short work of Russia With an aging squad, we knew that Russia would have it tough at the Euros this time around. Their opener against Belgium was always going to be a tough test. Roberto Martinez's men cruised to a 3-0 win thanks to a Lukaku brace and a goal from Thomas Meunier. The Belgians were without their star player Kevin De Bruyne with an eye socket fracture, but they didn't miss him at all. The team had enough creativity about them, and the manner in which they played showed just how threatening they really are. Yannick Carrasco was in sensational form and made a mockery of the Russian defence all night long. The defence also stood tall and was rarely threatened by the Russians, who would now be hoping for a better turn of events when they face Finland in their second game of the campaign.